Good morning, Australia. Good afternoon, USA, and good evening, UK. Wherever you're joining us today, I am super excited. We have the amazing Jean-Marie Paynell, and we are going to be talking all things behavior and discipline. So we're going to be talking about positive discipline today. And I'm super excited to be um, introducing our guests, and I'll do that in a minute. I'll just give everyone a few minutes to jump on because I know it's early morning here in Australia um, and people might be doing bedtime routine. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to say to all of the parents out there that are struggling or really feeling stressed or challenged with their child's behavior, and I know we had lots of questions coming in. We will be taking some questions live today as well. So if you didn't get a chance to submit your questions, just go ahead and type them into the event into the comments and we'll see them come up today. I just wanted to say you are not alone. There are so many parents going through the same things that you are. There's nothing wrong with your child for displaying those big emotions. And we're going to go through all of that today, what it means when we see that kind of behavior, what they're trying to communicate, and really how we can help support them through those moments um, and you know, help them work through that as well as building their skills. So without further ado, I would love to introduce our guest, Jean-Marie. Good morning or afternoon, I should say, in um, America. It's still, it's still morning. It's still morning. Okay. Thank you. And I'm just, I have to say, I'm always like in awe of technology that you can say, Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all these wonderful parents is just wonderful. So thank you, Sylvia, for inviting me to be here with you today and to share a little bit about what um, I believe are very important tools to have as we parent or uh, if we're caregivers or educators with uh, young children, and that is positive discipline. And to me, it is something that um, really goes beautifully hand in hand with the Montessori principles of really respecting uh, children and knowing how capable they are, and so on and so forth. So that's Absolutely. what I will be sharing uh, a bit today. And we can't wait. We've had so many questions submitted. So before we go into that, I wanted to introduce uh, you to everybody, to our audience. If they don't know already, you should know who she is. Um, doesn't need much introduction with me, but um, Jean-Marie is a parenting mentor and she's a home consult guiding parents to let go of those, you know, overwhelming feelings and enjoy raising self-sufficient and resilient children with ease. She also is the host of the Art of Parenting podcast and the founder of Your Parenting Mentor, formerly known as Voila Montessori, where she guides expectant parents, caregivers, and parents of young children to prepare their homes and themselves for children to thrive during the first years of life. Um, so we are going to be discussing a, a multitude of Montessori, conscious parenting and positive discipline. And like you said, they really all go hand in hand with each other. Um, I guess the first thing that would be good to explain to everyone listening is what is positive discipline and, and how does it differ from that traditional style of parenting? Well, um, so in a nutshell, positive discipline, first of all, is based in Alderian psychology. So Alfred Adler was actually a contemporary of Dr. Montessori. And it would have been, you know, I often fantasize how it would have been great if they were able to collaborate, but they didn't speak a common language. French apparently was the common language. They met only briefly. Um, and such, but he was an Austrian uh, psychiatrist who really helped us understand children's behavior. And that behavior is a form of communication. And it's especially true for our preverbal children, right? They, that's Absolutely. all they have is, yeah. is behavior. And that if we understand that and try to really detect what the message, the underlining message is behind their behavior, then, then that's all we really need, right? And to really, it, and, and Aldarian psychology, excuse me, is based in this notion that all of us, so all of us on this call, all of our children, all of us on the planet, 
need and thrive for belonging and significance. Absolutely. And that a child's misbehavior, quote unquote, is oftentimes just them saying, I am lacking in feeling belonging or significance. And when we truly understand that, then, you know, we're the adult in the room. We're the ones that have the tools to guide them because discipline is really, uh, our task is to lead them to self-discipline. And it's mm -hmm. something that, that, you know, we need to, to strengthen it. it they don't, come, you know, born with, with self-discipline, they're going to, to learn it. And we are here to, to guide them. Absolutely. And I love how you said that about, you know, building their skills, because it's all about self-discipline mm -hmm. and, and that's what it is, right? It's not about us as the adult doing something to the child. It's really about how we can help support and build their skill set. So exactly. I'm really excited to um, get stuck into this. If anyone has any comments or questions, feel free to post them. But we're going to start with um, the topic of yelling, shouting and screaming. So we did have a few questions. One of them came in from Tanya Sierra and she said, how do you find a natural consequence for constantly yelling? So besides modelling behaviour, um, you know, what can be done when a child is yelling out for something or screaming? Um, Courtney Logan had a similar question. She said, my little one screams um, your name over and over for attention. She's one and a half. I just want to know what the best way to correct this behavior and perhaps replace it with a more polite, you know, when she wants attention. So how would you tackle that? So there, uh, first, I would take into account their their age, right? Because an 18 month old who is repeating your name can simply be she's delighted to have figured out how to say your name. And she's like anything that she's learning to master, she's going to repeat it, right? Just like the the child who is who is discovering their vocal cords will will you know repeat these sounds over and over it's just them discovering their capabilities so you know i would i would almost make light of it is like wow you say my name really well <laughs> kind you know kind of dis discarding the fact that it's annoying you because from what i'm hearing from your questions it's the adults who are asking these questions who are annoyed, who are irritated, but it has nothing. I mean, the child is just, just testing things out. Right. So there, you know, the, a young child repeating your name, I think I would for one, try to not take it like it's an offense, right. Take it more like, Oh, wow. My child is so smart. They know my name. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and kind of that's, that's it. Um, I know that there are some parents, for example, I had a, um, family ask me, they did not want their child to call them by their first name. Mm. They wanted them to call them, you know, mom and dad. And that was really hard because the child had heard their name. And, and so there you just say, you know, when, when we're in the house, I prefer you call me daddy or mommy or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that again is, you know, we'll take repetition because they've, they discovered something uh, new. For the child who is constantly using a loud voice, there I would be really vigilant to always as much as you can to really go to the child, look at them in the eyes, put your hand on them and say, I can hear you. Whisper, there I can hear you. You don't and need to, oh, you don't oh, need oh, to. Oh. I'm hearing an echo. Oh, oh that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, that, uh, so, so there you're modeling, right. And you're going to them and just connecting because mm -hmm. remember children are thriving for connections. Yeah. And so when they are, you know, calling you out and all this as irritating or annoying as it is how they're doing it, it's still the base is that they want to connect. So please connect with them. Put your kind of your, you know, annoyance, take a deep breath, walk over, 
What is it that you need? We'll definitely get into that later. We're going to be talking about how the parent, you know, because it, it does stem a lot from our perspective and our triggers and a lot of the way we respond to children's mm-hmm. behaviour really does come from ourselves. So sometimes it's Completely. about... And, and we're definitely going to be getting yeah, into yeah, that later yeah. um, because I think that's a really important thing. When we see children's behaviour, like we need to look at ourselves and reflect and think, what is it that it's making me feel? And how is that then? How am I going to respond? Am I responding from my emotions or mm-hmm. am I responding to support the child? Right, so right. I think you made a really great point in not taking it personally. If they are using a really loud voice, just whisper, you know. <laughs> That, that and, and just to finish with the with the child who tends to use a loud voice is to just really say, I can't hear myself think when you scream. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, and that's I, I really think, what it yeah. is, because it, it just it triggers us. And we 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 kind of, you know, we we blank out like we don't want to yeah. deal with it. So just let the child know if you really want something from me say it in a way that I can hear you because when you scream, it's not because it's loud that I'm going to hear you better. And then the other thing, and this is just a little parentheses, but we have to also just have their auditory sense checked because sometimes people who talk loud are because they don't hear very well. Mm. So something to, you know, if it's something that is, that is really consistent and you, you know, maybe do some test of, kind of calling out their name in a whisper or calling out a food that they really want in a whisper and see if they hear it. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point as well. So looking for those other kind of factors in mm-hmm. the equation. Okay, our second um, question comes from Amanda and Amanda Jones. And now Amanda has actually shared something that a lot of parents are going through. And this is the hitting, the throwing, the biting, the pinching. So we'll give a few scenarios. Um, One of them is from Amanda. She says, my two, almost three-year-old has started hitting me and her dad when she's mad. She doesn't hit her teachers or other kids. Um, I've tried talking to her about it and letting her know it hurts. And we use gentle hands. I've tried redirecting her to hit other things, but that's not working too. Um, and, and to supplement that, you know, Ashley Charles said, you know, when my son has those big emotions or big feelings, he claws, he pinches, pulls hair. And this question, Jean-Marie, came up so many times. You know, we're talking where, like, you know, lots of the parents were saying about grabbing their skin or and, and this seems to be a common kind of um, issue that comes up specifically around children that are at that, you know, either nonverbal or or they could be verbal and they're still kind of going to those behaviours when they have those big emotions. So how what would you advise in those situations? So first, you know, I'll say it again, try not to take it personally. This is this is just development taking place, right? As, yeah. as Sylvia says, you know, with the, the pre-verbal child, they know exactly what they want, right? But they're not able to express it. So it's really like us going to a foreign country knowing exactly you know, that we really need to go to the bathroom and please somebody understand me, right? We're getting a little <laughs> frustrated. So it's kind of the same thing. And so their 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 physical way, that's the way that they know to express. That being said, we still need to put set boundaries, right? That hitting me and pinching me and all that is not something that I enjoy or will let anybody do. So here, you know, and that's the beauty also with positive discipline. It's really this notion of being firm and kind at the same time. So it's really that authoritative person who has compassion for the child's needs and also knows that there are, you know, a set of boundaries to be respected. So here I really try to use I messages where it's really of I cannot let you hit me because I am in control of my body and I cannot let you touch me. It's not you can't, because oftentimes when we say to a child, you cannot do this, they're (laughs) confused. That's what they're doing right now. Like, what do you mean I can't do it? Here, let me show you. I can do it some more, you know? (laughs) Yes, I can. So 
let's yes. use language in our favor and say, I cannot let you hit me. That hurts mm -hmm. and I don't like it. And, and you can hold on to their hands, you know, firmly look at them in the eyes and say, I know you're, I know you're upset and you're trying to tell me something, but I cannot let you hit me. Mm -hmm. So, and that's going to take some repetition, but you really have to, you know, hold on to those hands and, 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 and stop them. And so there, that's one thing. And then next is remembering, and this is a, a quote from uh, Rudolf Dreykus, who, who says that a misbehaving child is a discouraged child, right? So again, they're just trying to tell you something, right? And, and when we can detect how we're feeling about this situation, we can often understand what it is, the belief that they have behind this, um, yeah, sorry, yeah. this, you know, this understanding. And sometimes, you know, it's really about um, just needing attention or, or revenge or feeling inadequate. And that is how you're going to train yourself to be able to help them find better solutions. So in the, in the form of, you know, hitting and biting, right away, we stop it. I cannot let you do that. My job is to keep everyone safe and so on. But you're also seeing that this child is frustrated. This child is discouraged about something. So this is where you can offer options. And when I say options, I mean, just two very simple ones, right? So is, you know, do you need to go, you know, run around outside? Do you need to punch the pillow? Or do you need a hug? You know, it's it's really about what you're willing to do in that situation, right? Yeah. And, and those tools, um, you know, Jean-Marie, those are the tools that we're helping children build so that when they do feel that way, they know what else to do or exactly. what to do when they have those emotions. Because we have to remember that children are communicating so they're using those behaviors like you mentioned to communicate and let us know that something's upsetting them something's frustrating them they're feeling angry and what they can do instead so hitting is not okay so i exactly. always say that feelings are all feelings are valid right mm -hmm. feeling angry feeling jealous feeling whatever it is they're all valid but certain behaviors that are associated with that are not okay and then it's about like you said giving them the choice squeeze this pillow or you know stomp your feet show me how angry you are so that they that we're almost retraining those neural pathways exactly exactly or a tool as to um and to and to you know to help them ask for help sometimes sometimes we just need help with a big emotion so if you know instead of hitting me you can ask me for a hug that's okay right yeah, I'm cool. always willing to give you a hug and, and please be willing to always give them a hug, even if they're tormenting you, because <laughs> that is the way we're going to calm everybody's heartbeat and, and kind of, yeah. you know, bring everybody down to a calmer sense. So, yes, I think that's a really important point that you just mentioned, because when children are feeling that emotion and we're up here, so the child is down here and we're up here and our emotions are running our responses, the child doesn't have the ability to come up to our level. So we always have to try and, you know, bring ourselves to the child's level so that we can connect with them. Because if we don't have that connection, then, you know, it's going to be really hard to work exactly. through that. Um, exactly. Yes. We, we have a question here from Alex on this topic. And um, what about when hitting doesn't seem to come from anger? Oh, this one comes up a lot. How do I teach my 19-month-old um, or 19-year-old or 19-month-old to ask for space? Um, he's using hitting as a signal that he needs space from other kids. Oh, yeah, 19-month-old. We got that one. <laughs> I was going to say, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so there it's about, uh, you know, maybe there's some, some nonverbal signs that you could uh, help them. I don't know if you know much about the brain in the palm of the hand, which is um, <clears throat> Dan Siegel's uh, explanation of, of, you know, how the brain works. And um, actually in the No Drama Discipline from Tina Payne Bryson and Dan Siegel, they have a whole kind of cartoon about how to explain it to a young child. And so this is something you can explain to children about when we get upset, you know, we, we, our, our, our brain is, is, 
working upstairs with big emotions and we want to push things and get upset and all this, but what can we do to come to, you know, come back to a calmer place? So that could be just a nonverbal, like I'm feeling like this. That means I've flipped my lid. I, I need space. Right. Yeah. Um, and then what I think is important for this child is if you know that they are needing space, I would uh, really create with them uh, kind of what we call a positive timeout place where this is kind of preventive uh, notion where when we're starting to feel in our body that we're going to get upset, we can go to this special place to calm ourselves, right? So it yeah. could be in that place, there could be, you know, a nice big teddy bear we can cuddle with, there can be maybe a, one of our favorite books, there can be just a picture that we like, uh, whatever that might be. And this is something that you create together. But again, it's about helping our children understand their own body and understanding the messages that their body is giving them that it's time to walk away or it's time yeah. to, you know, go in our, our timeout place or, or yeah, go we, outside or whatever. Um, we definitely use those strategies in, in, in a Montessori space. So we call it a calming corner, which is mm -hmm. the same thing. So we mm -hmm. have the emotions chart with all the pictures of how they're feeling and then a basket of tools to help them regulate. Um, we did have a child who was this was needing space and ended up biting anyone who was walking past right because that was their way they were non-verbal so it's the same situation as this little one and we would just express it looks like you need space right you know, people right. are not providing so modeling that and you know and kind of just putting our hand around like you know in between the two children and just saying you really need space let's you know find a space for you and then redirecting them and guiding them. So I really right. think that modeling helps in that situation. Um, but yeah, the calming corner is a fantastic idea as well. And at home, and, and it can be done at home. The, the trick is yeah. to do it together so that it's not something you're creating and saying, here, go cool off there. It's really about <laughs> kind of doing that, that, you know, preemptive, uh, conversation about feeling what, what we feel in our body and, and children are, are very aware of their body. So they'll tell you, you know, my tummy hurts or, right or whatever it is. And so, so that's a signal. Your body is so smart. That's a signal when you can go and just cool off and that's it. Yep. Um, th this is, we, we might get into this question, uh, at the moment, uh, Brie, I just wanted to show B Lily was saying, I love these little scripts we can use. They're so helpful. Thank you so much. Um, they really are very helpful when you've got the right language and communication around how to respond. Um, Arlene was saying, this is a great question and we might hit that topic right now since it's coming up. How does a parent not feel stressed? <laughs> This is a great question. If we had the solution to this one, I think we'd all be rich. Um, stress when a two-year-old is whining and crying to get his way. Um, it affects me greatly and I end up shouting at my son when he's whinging and whining and, you know, to have his way. And my husband is worried that shouting is affecting me with stressful reactions in my body. Um, so I think, you know, on top of this question, we had a few about you know, trying to remain calm myself. That was from Ash. Daniel um, Bach said the same thing, to be calm myself, less shouting. You know, how do we stop being that shouty, responsive type of parent or caregiver? Well, for one, I'm going to say kudos for being aware. That's, that's, that's the first step is just knowing that you want to evolve. And this is maybe the shouting is what you 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 know received as a child and that's your that's your reaction because that's all you know um so first you're aware that's that's beautiful right there you're yeah. observing that you want to do things differently and so um here and i'll share uh i'll share with sylvia kind of this chart that i have which is really about you know first detecting what how this is making you feel so you know you said stressed or challenged or or whatever that that emotion that you the adult is feeling is going to take you down kind of a road of being a detective 
as to what your child's message really is, because sometimes it just is, you know, I'm, I'm hurting, validate my feelings. That's all they're trying to tell you. But you know, they're not, they're, 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 their brain isn't fully developed. So they can't say that so eloquently, right? They, so they whine and they, 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 they <laughs> bother you and they, they kind of irritate you. So for me, it's just, first of all, to really, really remember to try as much as possible not to take things personally, right? Mm -hmm. that, yeah. that, that we have to remember that a child is never giving you a hard time. They are having a hard time. Yeah. And we are the adult in the room. So we need to come back to a calmer place. So do whatever you need to do. <sighs> to take, you know, whether it's, it's, whether it's, it, and you can even say if the, if the child is safe, you can say, you know, I'm having a really hard time being in this room right now. I'm just going to step away for a second. Exactly. Yeah. That gives you the opportunity to go splash some cold water on your face, to, to shake it out, whatever you need to do to protect and conserve your energy. Yeah. And there you can really, you know, get down to the child's eye level and say, I can, I see that you really want my attention. And, you know, you can, you can just ask me, mommy, and, and come and show me what you need. Mm -hmm. We don't need to, you know, be la la la, it kind of hurts my ears. And, and yeah. then I need to step away. So just, you know, try as much as possible. Like I say, to to find ways to calm yourself. Because it's true that the shouting, you know, it ends up stressing us, then we feel guilty because, oh my gosh, yeah. I shouted again. I'm such a terrible parent. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Just remember that <clears throat> mistakes in general, whether they're your children's mistake or your own mistakes are always opportunities for you to learn, okay. right? So you've come onto this call, you're asking, you're, you're, you're wanting to learn. So mm -hmm. like I say, find the tools that are going to calm you <sighs> so you can come down to the child's level and help them and connect yeah. with them and help them figure out what it is that they truly need. Yeah. And I think having a toolkit, like you mentioned for ourselves, so counting to three, breathing, stepping away. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is we're actually modeling for the child. So we're exactly. showing them how we regulate our emotions. And mm -hmm. that is such a great learning opportunity for the child to see, oh, well, mommy needs to take a deep breath or walk away. And, you know, letting the child know. So, and and you're right when you said that parents just acknowledging that they are doing that and that they want to change. That's such a huge awareness and consciousness. Mm -hmm. yes. They should really feel yes. um, good about that. Um, Sarah said, being a detective, they're having a hard time. Exactly that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we're going to move on to uh, engaging cooperation because this has come up quite a lot. Um, Kelly Marie was saying, what about straight up just not listening? My three-year-old refuses to pick up her toys, brush her teeth. Almost anything she does feels like um, it almost feels like she's in charge of the house. So when it comes to that, I wanted to also read out another question because engaging cooperation is something that a lot of parents are struggling with, especially around routine. So things that need to be done, you know, that bedtime, brushing teeth, getting dressed in the morning. Um, you know, em Emily was saying, running around, laughing, jumping on the bed, <laughs> rolling away. I'm not laughing at that. I can just, it's re very relatable. Um, Christine was saying, eat. My toddler hardly eats. You know, you offer 10 things, 10 different ways. Um, people are just really struggling with those kind of engaging corporations. So what is it that um, we can do in those situations when it comes to positive discipline? So one, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm, we'll repeat it, but it's, it's this notion of firmness and kindness. So, so mm -hmm. know ahead of time what your limits are. And, and, and I say this because every household is going to be different. Every family, every home has yeah. different values, uh, cultural norms, you know, whatever. In one house, jumping on the couch must be perfectly okay. In another house, it could be that's totally, you know, off. So know what you're, what you can put up with, basically. But the things that, that you, it's a firm no you have to stay consistent. 
right? You have to really know that that is something that you will not allow. Mm -hmm. And so there it's about that repetition of, of going back. But just to, to backtrack to what you were saying of the, the three-year-old, you know, feeling empowered and running the household, well, great. That's, that's wonderful. You have a leader on your hands, right? You have a, a little adult in the making who knows what she wants and she's going to do everything she can to get it. So I think that is a positive trait. So first of all, let's see that in, in that positive light, but to help her have control of her life of her identity and all this, which is, you know, the three-year-olds, that's a big thing. It's like, no, me do it. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm here. I'm a full I think that's from, that's from two, Jean-Marie. It's that's like, from one and a half or yeah. 40 months. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. But here to me, it's the, the, the best tools in, in the positive discipline toolbox is actually creating a routine with them. So only take that one routine that is the most challenging. And what this means is that you have a conversation with your child and any other family members. I like to do it kind of at a committee level. So if there's other children, if there's other adults, as you sit down, and you just really have a brainstorm session where, you know, I've noticed that in the morning for us to get out of the house, it's like, you know, I end up telling you what to do and I get upset and I'm screaming and then we don't start the day with fun. And, and I want it, you know, I want it to be fun. What about you? And most often they'll say, yeah, I want to have fun. So there we brainstorm, we say, well, what are all the things that we have to do before we leave the house in the morning? And you write them all down and, you know, let them be silly if they need to pet the dog three times or hug their dolls, whatever you were brainstorming, we're writing yeah. them all down. And then once we have that list, it's like, okay, did we forget anything? You can add a few things, you know, if we forgot to put socks on or whatever. And there, be creative in how you are going to make this a visual aid. Meaning if you love to draw, maybe draw these little things out or you can take photos of your child acting, you know, out brushing their teeth and putting on their socks and so forth so that you can have a visual aid of what are the steps that need to happen. Mm. And this we set it up in a place where the child can see. And the routine becomes the leader. So you no longer nag or remind. You just say, oh, I don't know. Why don't you go check? We made that nice chart. And the child feels empowered. They are in control. They know what to do. And you can go do your makeup, do your hair, do whatever you need to do. And you just tell the child, oh, I've got something to do to get ready. You get ready. You know what to do. And that's it. Mm. So it's really about coming together, finding the solutions together, brainstorming together, and helping them kind of plan it out so that they can remind themselves. And they love like the whole, you know, pretending and taking pictures because then they can uh, do it. I would also suggest if you can be creative and maybe put it kind of on a on a scratch or Velcro thing because sometimes they like yeah, to change the order. Yes. And it yes. really doesn't matter because we want them to be in control. So if they want to brush their teeth before they put on their socks, who really cares? Right. Yes. As long as we're out the door on time uh, with a smile and, and, and well-dressed. So uh, yes. that, that to me is, is really that creating the routine with them is, is a game changer. I know I did it when my, when I was having some very, very challenging mornings and it, it was, you know, it was wonderful. Um, Alex was asking at what age can we incorporate a chart? I mean, I even feel that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Jean-Marie, but even nonverbal children can have the, you know, the, you know, the yeah. pictures yeah. that they put up. And I think it's something. Yeah. And I think actually a uh, Simone in her, um, the Montessori toddler, she had like mm -hmm. little images, you know, that yeah. are just, so they just have a notion because remember children are very, sensitive to order. Yeah. 
Yes. And if they kind of know what is expected of them, it's it's very reassuring. It's just it's it's very um, less stress than, you know, when am I going to be told to do next? Like they they they're you know these orders that are coming from from these people here. Yeah, if we're right. setting them up with this with this notion of this is what's going to happen, then they're a lot more willing to comply. And I think it is all about that independence, like you were saying, you know, the autonomy, the independence, they really just want to be involved. So a lot of the time these power struggles come along because it's always us telling them what's going to happen or telling them what's going to do. And we're forgetting that children innately have this sense of I want to do, I want to be independent, I want to be involved. So finding ways of engaging them in the whatever it is, you know, sitting down, eating for dinner, okay, setting the table or getting them involved in these little tasks that makes them feel that they're contributing to what's happening in the family and in the space, Um, you know. Which is, which is, remember when, when I said at the beginning, significance and belonging, right? Yeah. Is, is we're, we're, we're giving them that, uh, that power for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And I just wanted to point out something that I found that really works with children who are quite young and that maybe they're not ready to do that problem solving and brainstorming with you because they don't have the verbal communication. What I find really works is when we acknowledge their emotions and feelings, you really don't want to brush your teeth. It's time. And then just really like informatively, it's time to brush teeth you know, are you going to have a turn or am I going to have a turn first? So that way you're giving them a choice, which is almost like a guided choice. So, and, but it's still kind of getting them on board to try and engage their cooperation and you can just make it fun, you know, as well, Mm -hmm. like singing a song or trying to do it that way. So, um, and then, and then I will add also for, you know, maybe the, the older ones that are a little bit more verbal is to try as much as possible to ask curiosity questions, right? About, um, oh my gosh, it's time for us to go to the park. What do you need to put on your back? Yeah. Instead of shouting out an order, put on your coat, right? (laughs) So again, we want, you know, we want to encourage that, that autonomy. Of course, absolutely. Um, we just had a comment here. Thank you, Sylvia and Jean-Marie. Love your approach of tools um, for parents to self-manage. Ah, uh, yes, going back to the parents mm-hmm. being shouters and, yeah, good on you for really, you know, realising yes. that and being conscious of that. That's absolutely amazing. Um, okay, let's go to our next question. Um, this is something that uh, we've had one or two questions about. So Helen was saying, what about your when your child changes their mind constantly? Um, my two-year-old asked me for help, but then changes their mind while I'm helping him. It drives me nuts. <laughs> Sometimes it takes me about 20 minutes to prepare yogurt um, because, you know, um, a, with a bit of jam because of that, even though it may have been the first thing I proposed. So, like, I guess when you're offering something to a child and then they constantly are changing their mind and then they say, oh, yes, I want that, and then you give them that and then they change their mind and they don't want that anymore and they say they ask for something else how would we kind of navigate that so there i think it's more of a environmental thing than it is you know necessarily positive discipline i would you know try as much as you as we can to empower that two-year-old to prepare their own snack yeah because then they make their choices and Exactly. They, they 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 deal with it, right? And and it's yeah. like, oh, you know, you didn't want to put that many, you know, dried fruit in your yogurt. Okay, well, next time you know that only one spoon is is enough, or or you know whatever. Yeah. But I think that we need to, you know, I often say that I want to help parents kind of get out of the role of being um, the servant or 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 the teacher, right? We are a guide. That. We are a guide. So let's set up the environment where, you know, you put out the, the, the ingredients and say, oh, it's snack time here. Let me, you know, come, you know, help, help prepare your own kind of thing so that there's not this, you know, incessant of, you know, this short order cook who can never get the order right, because that's what we end up being, right? We're in that oh, situation yeah. of, and, and, and that's not okay. So let's empower them to, to make those choices. 
Yeah, absolutely. And this is the thing, a lot of the power struggles, like we we went back on this and we were talking about that come from this fact that, you know, I'm going to be doing this for you and I'm instructing. And so really empowering the child with the tools and, and you know, with parents that are worried about, oh, but if I set up a snack station or some snacks for my child, they're just going to keep going to that and they're not going to eat lunch. There's boundaries around that, right? Exactly. So you only put out those small things or those items that you feel comfortable with them eating in between, um, you know, lunch and dinner or whatever it is, morning uh, from breakfast to lunch, and right. then you know, allowing them to have that autonomy and that independence. Because when we give them those tools, a lot of these struggles will then start reducing because they just don't exist. There's no, you know. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and very good point because, you know, it's it's limiting the choices of what they have access to. Because when yeah. we, <clears throat> you know, when a child is getting dressed, when a child uh, is hungry, when we say, what do you want? They don't know. <laughs> or you open the fridge and go, what would you like to eat? Yeah. It's overwhelming. So, yeah. so, you know, think ahead of time what it is you can offer mm. and, you know, put out a banana and put out some yogurt and say, would you, you know, like a banana or yogurt and, and, and yeah. kind of they, they choose. Uh, but yes, definitely empowering them. And I, and since we are on the notion of food, I think there was a question uh, before about um, the child not eating and you proposing uh, yeah. you know, all sorts of things here again, I would be really vigilant to not be in that role of the short order cook of, you know, of, of trying to please the child with, with everything. Food can be a huge power struggle. Yeah. So for me, and this is, you know, my approach to, to parenting. And I know that it's, you know, been written up about also this, this responsibility that we have around food. Our responsibility as the adult is to prepare quality, healthy food. That's it. What they eat is none of our problem. Children know, children are wise to listen to their body when they are hungry and they will eat, you know, appropriately. It is, it is part of our responsibility to maybe not have, you know, food accessible 24 hours seven, because yen, yes, then they might not be hungry when it comes to dinner time. So, yeah. you know, again, this is, uh, every family is different. There's some families that graze all day. There's some families that only have three meals a day, whatever your family is, you know, that is fine. But just know that your responsibility is to offer the nutrition and the child's responsibility is to eat what its body is asking for. That's it. Right. I, so don't yeah. don't like get, uh, you know, upset because my child isn't eating enough or no, just trust that they are listening to their bodies. Right. And, and that this yeah. whole forcing to finish your plate or, or forcing to, you know, have two more bites of this or that is is unwillingly kind of setting us up for, you know, all sorts of different little eating, you know, disorders further down the line, or this power struggle that we have uh, with food and parents. So just say this is this is the family meal I've prepared. And you're welcome to taste it. And that's, that's what there is. And you know, some child will say, I don't want it. I say, that's okay, you don't you don't have to eat it if you don't want, want it. They might get hungry later on and you say, oh, yes, you're hungry. You, that's right. You don't have much dinner, but I'll make you a big, nice breakfast. That's it. Right. Because then we get into this guilt tripping of, oh, my child, I'm starving. My child, oh, my gosh. They're gonna be like, and, and this is a really challenging thing, though, Jean-Marie, right? Huge. It's, it's, and, and this is it's really challenging our notions and traditions and cultures okay because a lot of it comes culturally I know with with you know parents it's like you know they, they I my job is to feed my child right yeah. Yeah. and this is where a lot of that thinking needs to kind of shift a little bit and we're not sitting here saying that you know, oh, if your child doesn't eat dinner, they're just going to starve and they're going to be malnutritioned. <laughs> it's just, a child will never let themselves starve, just just so and, you know. And this is the thing. If we give them that 
autonomy over knowing when they're hungry and how much they need to eat. And toddlers and young children don't eat as much as we think that that, you know, we put this huge plate in front of them and expect them to finish it all. Um, so I think it's really about shifting our perspective and understanding and just giving a little bit of trust into the child. I mean, Arlene's just said, oh, yes, my two-year-old son has been empowered to make food choices since it was about one. You know, I offer him two to three choices and he picks from, you know, from perfect, those. Perfect, perfect, yeah. So, um, you know, I just, I, it's yeah. a really... It's a really sensitive point. Um, it is. And I know it, it, it will, tr- like a lot of parents will think very deeply about that because it's something that's ingrained. Yes. Um, so I'm glad that you brought that up. Yeah. Um, how do you respond to throwing at mealtimes? Oh, yeah, this is <laughs> when my little one, 16 months, will throw a plate or cup or spoon when he's finished or done or doesn't want it. So this is this is I'm I'm sorry to say Jessica, but unfortunately extremely common and and, and kind of normal. Again, this is kind of that you know pre-verbal child of instead of saying, "Oh, this was a delicious meal, thank you, I'm all done," they'll go, "Poof, I'm done," right? So so there you you step right in and and you maybe anticipate. Um, and you, oh, it looks like you're all done and you clear, yeah. you clear everything, you know, in, in arm's reach from them to, to be able to throw and, um, and you can maybe, you know, give them a sign language of all done, yeah, all done. uh, things like that. Um, I think I was doing more, I think yeah, uh, all done is, I, I don't know, I forget, but nonverbal cues to say I'm all done. The other thing is just being vigilant of how much food you put in their plate. Just like Sylvia was saying, we we tend to think that, you know, they're hungrier or will eat more than, than they actually do. So I prefer putting in small portions in their plate and serving them several times. Or even with a child who, who, you know, has the eye-hand coordination developed to serve themselves. Like I prefer putting the, the food on the table and everybody serves themselves. So we are making the decision of how much we put on our plate. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, and when there is, when a child is done and there's still food on the plate, well, they're sensorial explorers. They're they're going to put their hands in it and, and play with it and, and you know. Especially at 16 or 18 months and 14 exactly. months. Exactly, right. And you've got to remember they're also going through a, traje- a trajectory schema. They might be, you know, wanting to throw or, or seeing what, what happens when I put throw that off my, you know, off the side of the wherever they're sitting, off the table, off the high chair or, you know, it's this, it's this trial and error, it's this experimental, they're sensory, they want to throw things. So making sure outside of mealtimes that you're having a lot of those activities where they can push things, they can throw things. Um, and then, like you said, just making a matter of fact, oh, I see you're all done. Let's pack away the dish, you know, and you can encourage the child to pack away their dish in a little tub on the floor, um, you know, if that's accessible. But really just making it matter of fact, and I know it's really hard not to get triggered <laughs> by it, but whenever we see these behaviours, we have to remember don't think of it from an adult perspective. Think about what the child is trying to communicate or do or tell us or, or just you know. exploring like, wow, yeah. this is this is new to me. Like, you know, they're brand new on this planet. Yeah. Uh, and then also for, you know, the food maybe that's been thrown on the ground, I would definitely have a little routine of cleaning up also yeah. because I think it's really important to involve them. Um, not only in preparing food, but also, you know, cleaning up after dinner and, and all of that. So, yeah, having some little towels, we have exactly. some little towels available if they clean up a spill, um, you know, and, and someone just wrote here, actually, I'm struggling with cleaning, you know, whatever I do or offer, how do I offer my 26 month old, you know, that's never willing to help modeling, you know, like really, you know, oh, I'm just going to oh, wow, look at all, and making it really engaging, you know, like, oh, look, all the water's dried up when I put the towel in. Oh, that's, I'm going to go, you know, and just really kind of, that's how I would do it. Jean-Marie. Definitely. And and I would, in, you know, instead of saying, uh, I need you to help me clean up, I say, would you be interested in doing this? 
Like yeah. make it, make it so that it's like, oh, the best thing on the planet to come <laughs> clean up this spill. Like, oh my gosh, would you like to try using a sponge? And 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 that's it. how that's how you're gonna yeah. get their their yeah. intrigue, right? It's the it's the tone. Like a lot of the yeah. time, it's the tone and the enthusiasm that we show. That mm -hmm. it's almost like um, it's oh, what are they what uh, it's um, oh, when it when somebody else. When you do it, it's contagious. That's yes, it. That's what yes, I was going to say. It's, yes, your enthusiasm yes. and your tone, it's almost like contagious to a child. So they pick up on that energy and they really, um, you know, they yeah. really kind of love, you know, being involved. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to show you this comment because I'm really, um, as a registered dietitian, I completely agree with division yes. of responsibility oh, thank you. approach to eating. I was, um, I really wanted to put that And that was the term I was trying to say to division of responsibility. Yes. Yeah. Thank so you. thank you so much for, yeah. um, we don't have your name, but we really appreciate that kind of feedback because it really mm -hmm. validates the discussions that we're having, you know, around all of that. Um, I wanted to, before we go on to um, another question, Jessica was saying, thank you so much for the tips. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. These discussions are something really important to be had. Um, I wanted to talk about sharing or when friends are over or when children are really um, uh, involved with another child or if your child is, you know, kind of taking something off another child. I'm just trying to look for the questions here. Oh, yeah. So sibling quarrels is a big one, Jean-Marie, when mm -hmm. children are, you know, arguing and fighting over a specific toy or hitting each other. Um, Grace was saying, my son is three and three months. Uh, turn taking with his toys has become a huge problem. Whenever friends are over, he doesn't let anyone touch anything uh, without, you know, that pulling it out of their hands. We talk about practice like turn taking and we practice that, but it doesn't seem to be working. What would you suggest? So this is a tough one because remember, mm -hmm. they're, they're very egocentric little beings, right? They're, yeah. they're, they're the only ones on the planet. The sun belongs to them. Mommy and daddy, <laughs> everything is just mine, 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 right? There's yes. just, that, that's, that's just how that development is going on. And this is, this is very true. And, and Dr. Montessori explains this very well when she talks about, you know, the four planes of development. And here we're talking about that first plane where yeah. the, the child before three is this unconscious learner, right? They're just being driven by a life force to, to go out and, and, and adapt to, to their time, place, and culture. So we have to remember that that is also just where they're at uh, developmentally. Yeah. Um, and so sharing is something that that will come with maturity. And it is not something that we can force a child to do. So I'm I'm really very against, you know, you have to share. Because why? Like, we don't like to share, like, you know, if, if an adult were coming, you know, you know, give me your car, I want to take it out for a drive or whatever. It's like, no, like, <laughs> so why, why do we have this expectation on children to have to share what is their like prized possessions, which are their toys? So here I would have that understanding and, and that kind of that empathy going into this conversation. But, you know, maybe for this uh, three-year-old who is having friends come over and does not want to share their toys, you could very well have a conversation beforehand and say, you know, <clears throat> your friend... Um, you know, Joey is coming over and I've noticed you don't really like him playing with, you know, your trucks. Maybe let's put your trucks away so that, you know, that, that it's okay. You, you keep them safe, but what are some toys that you're willing to play with him? So mm -hmm. we're not saying sharing, we're not saying giving up. We're saying that you're okay with him playing with you or, or with, and maybe, set up a special environment when those friends come over. Like we prepare our homes when our guests come over, right? We, we fluff up the pillows and then make sure we have champagne in the fridge or whatever. So we're preparing. So let's help our children kind of also anticipate and remember that yeah. there's going to be another child in my space 
that's going to be interested in my things and, and kind of help them prepare of, of how to deal with it. And then, you know, also say like, and if you, and if he, you know, takes something you, you, you know, but I think it's important to explain that when, when we do have our toys out and we're inviting people over, they're going to be interested and they're going to want to play with your toys. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's make sure that we can just watch them play with our toys and that it's okay because they're going to leave and your toys will still be here. Right. So it's kind of the, just this conversation of reassurance, I think that we need to have with them and they, and then maybe finding solution with them as yeah. well, again, involving them, a three-year-old yeah. can definitely tell you, you know, and, and, you know, if they end up putting everything in the closet, <laughs> it might be a little complicated, but. <laughs> oh, well, I think you will, the thing is that, you know, when you do give them that, that, that warning and that, you know, it's always the pre kind of situation is the best. So like, you know, being proactive and, and talking exactly. about those things and building it up and, and having that understanding, okay, this is a really special car. Let's pack this one away and let's keep these ones out for your friends and allowing them to be involved with that and create, like you said, putting things away that are really kind of, they, you know, that's going to cause them a little bit of upset and then them choosing, okay, let's choose five toys or whatever it is that you are okay with your friends using. Right. And then if as if an issue does come up when the friends are there, you would then do the same steps, like acknowledging, oh, it's really upsetting that you know, such and such is using your thing. And yeah, you know, and then giving them the tools on what they can do in that situation. You know, maybe ask him, Oh, excuse me, can I please have a turn? You know, and modeling. Or, or maybe that. having something you can trade with him or, yeah. or something. And sometimes even role playing with your children before their friends come over, right? Yeah. So that because these are all like social skills that we're, we need them to learn, they don't come born with all of these, right? We need to help them yeah. get to this place of being okay with somebody walking in their, you know, room and taking things that are theirs. Like that's, that's a big, <laughs> that's a big deal. So we just need to, to kind of help them prepare. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, it's all in the preparation and, you know, I, I feel like even children, for all the parents that have younger children that are thinking about the same types of situations, I want to just let you know that regardless if your child can verbally communicate back to you, they mm -hmm. still understand and they can still be involved in all of the skills and all of the tools that we've discussed today. Because a lot of the misconception comes from, oh, my child is, you know, uh, only 18 months or two years old and they don't understand. Um, so I just wanted to say that, you know, they can point to things and they can, once you do engage with them, it is something that they um, they are able to. Definitely, um, definitely. Yeah. And and somebody, you, you mentioned something about sibling rivalry. Oh, um, yes. I just have one point about that is to try as much as possible to put them in the same boat. Do not take sides. You know Especially, nothing. You know nothing. You saw nothing. Yes. You just yes. go back to, oh, I know you two love each other and you're going to find a way to work this out. Try as much as possible to, you know, again, empower them to, to find ways of, of their discourse because we're not always going to be around to help them out and, and help them negotiate and all that. So mm. yes, you know, we are there to maybe suggest different tools or suggest different ways, but try as much as possible to kind of step out and not, um, and, and, and definitely not take sides because mm. that can be just and very disempowering for, you know, one of the child. Yeah, sometimes we do it unconsciously as well, mm -hmm. Jean-Marie. So if we hear some quarreling and stuff going on, we walk in and then we assume because one child is more upset than the other, what did you do? What did, especially if there's yeah. an older sibling involved. So 100% when, um, you know, when you do see two children really upset, I just describe, oh, you're so upset right now. I can see that, you know, you're both really struggling and all the blocks are on the floor, right? So I haven't literally you know, 
uh, said right, anything, right. Any, yeah. uh, playing the blame game or why did you do this and don't do that because we don't see half the time what's going on. Exactly. And then, like you said, you know, letting them know that, you know, they love each other and and maybe trying to like help problem solve so that they start building these skills because right. we want them to have these skills in any situation that they're going to be in. Um, Sarah was saying, love your sibling rivalry tip. Makes so much sense. Thank you. Um, and I know that we are, we've just run out of time. I've just had a look at the time and it's, um, you know, we've, we've had such an amazing conversation and so many comments come through and questions. So I really just wanted to say thank you so much, Jean-Marie, for being here and discussing such, you know, challenging and important conversations that we're having with everyone. Mm, my pleasure. My pleasure. To me, you know, I, I really um, am a firm believer that that parenting for one should never be done alone. It's it's a it's a team sport. So we're here. Sylvia and I are here, right? Where we're passionate about helping parents and 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 supporting you and and empowering you to to really parent the way you want to parent because we come to parenting with the only you know, uh, instruction manual was our own childhood. And sometimes yeah. that's not necessarily what we want to repeat, but we just don't know how to retrain our brains, retrain our reactions and all that. So for one, just kudos for you, you know, to want to be aware and to be uh, intentional about how you want to parent your children. So yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, uh, so for everyone watching out there, if you're watching on our YouTube channel, I know that on Guide and Grow TV, we have some amazing um, tools and things on engaging cooperation and positive discipline. But for Jean-Marie, um, can you please tell everyone where they can find you? You've got an amazing podcast. And if you've, um, yeah, just go ahead and, and let everyone know where they can find more about you. Sure. So I am at yourparentingmentor.com. And there, uh, actually, I have just opened the doors to the parenting school, which is uh, something that I've worked really hard on blending Montessori positive discipline, mindfulness practices. And it's uh, a course, but at the same time, it is mentoring where I will be doing a lot of kind of very similar to this, where we are come together. Uh, because I think, you know, we all are challenged with with pretty much the same challenges, like all of your questions Absolutely. today are, are pretty yeah. universal. Yeah. Um, and so that's something. So when you go on my website, you'll see there's the parenting school. Uh, otherwise, I have some free downloads. And and yes, I do have the podcast, The Art of Parenting. So beautiful. We might after the um, broadcast, Jean-Marie, we'll just pop all those into the comments. So everyone who's listening, you can find the links to all of our resources. Um, you know, everyone was saying thank you so much. And thanks. Yes. Thanks to the other parents and caregivers yes, for joining yes. and asking the questions. It's like you said, it takes a community, um, you know, to raise children and, um, you know, it's, it really is a testament to all of us that are in this together. So you guys are not alone. Thanks so no. much for joining us. Um, yes. Until our next broadcast, take care and uh, we'll see you all soon. Bye. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye.